uh, one of the most gruesome scenes I certainly have I have ever experienced. Blood covered practically every surface in the home. Uh, there, there was clear evidence that the suspect had gone into the attic. There was blood in the attic. There was blood in the basement. Blood in the sinks. Yeah, there was blood in in the refrigerator. Blood in the bathrooms and in the showers, and it covered practically the entire residence. Warning. The podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast, The Murder of Ronald Browning, Part 1 of 4. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast. I am Wendy. And I'm David. Well, David, you went to Beckley, West Virginia and recorded another podcast without me. I did, and I'm sorry you weren't there, and my guests were very sorry you weren't there, too. Well, I'm sure they were. Work called, and, you know, it just didn't work out, unfortunately, this time. But why don't you tell us a little bit about what we have here? I know it's a murder of a gentleman named Ronald Browning, and uh, what, what can you tell me about that? It's a fascinating case. I know we say that about all of them, but this four-part series is going to take the audience on a little bit of a ride with a couple of professional investigators from Beckley, West Virginia. My guests were a friend of mine named David Allard, who, by the way, was just promoted to deputy chief of the Beckley Police Department the day before I arrived. David and I met in 2017 when we completed the FBI National Academy Session 267 in Quantico, Virginia. So right now I have to stop and give a shout out to all of our brothers and sisters, literally from around the world, that we met and attended that session with in Quantico, Virginia, in session 267. He was joined by his sergeant, Morgan Bragg, who runs the detective unit up there right now. And the case is going to be interesting in a lot of ways. I'm just going to hit the highlights. This crime scene that they went to, they both described it as one of the most gruesome that they'd ever seen based on the violence they saw. They also talked about how the case moved at a very fast pace. We've heard those before. But the suspect that ultimately identified was never on the radar and probably wasn't even a consideration when the case started. And also with the people that are listening are going to hear the importance of communication inside of a police department and with other police departments and the art of slowing down and listening to small things that you hear. And I'm going to leave it at that because there's some big clues and some things that glued this case together based on communication skills and people taking the time to listen. Okay, well, with that, let's dig in to part one of four on the murder of Ronald Browning. Let's go. Well, welcome back to the Murder Police Podcast. I'm David, and today we've got some special guests. I'm actually in Beckley, West Virginia, to interview two fine people on an interesting murder investigation that occurred here a few years back. First of all, a good friend of mine that I happened to meet at the FBI National Academy back in 2017, I believe. Yes. And just newly promoted yesterday to Deputy Chief of the Beckley Police Department, my friend Dave Aller. Dave, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Dave, and we're glad to have you here. Yeah, and I've been stoked about trying to get this one out loud. Wendy is sorry she couldn't make it. It it kills her not to be on these, and it kills me not to have her with us on these twos because she brings so much more to them. So. We also have Morgan Bragg, a detective with the Beckley Police Department. How are you doing, Morgan? I'm doing very well. I appreciate you being here today. Dave, tell me a little bit about you, your career, hobbies, interests, anything that, that would help the audience get to know you a little bit better. Well, you know, I was born and raised here in West Virginia. From an early age, I knew that I wanted to go into the Air Force, follow my grandfather's career. So, you know, I never had an interest in law enforcement. I go straight from high school into the Air Force. During that time period, I started to have some friends that I graduated with. I would come in on weekends. They were policemen here in, in Beckley and Sophia, some of the smaller surrounding areas. And then my aunt started dating an FBI agent, and they ended up getting married. So I got exposed to it really at that point, and I would come home and do ride-alongs. And, you know, really that, from, from that point, I was hooked. I knew this was a career that I wanted to do. I finished my enlistment with the Air Force. I get hired with Newport News Sheriff's Department in Newport News, Virginia. I worked there for a year. 
pretty much in the jail the entire time. Apply here in 2002. As luck would have it, my grandmother sees the posting in the, in the newspaper, sends it to me. My wife and I come back here, take the test, ultimately get hired. I've been here 20 years now, and as you said yesterday, I just got promoted to deputy chief. I've, I've had a very blessed career. Over the past 17 years, I've been in the detective bureau. Over the past five years, I've led our detective bureau as the chief of detectives. Uh, Morgan's the assistant chief of detectives. I've also been a full-time task force officer with the FBI on the Joint Terrorism Task Force during the, the past four years. Uh, so really, without having his leadership and, and you know, while I'm away, it was three days a week I was working in Charleston, West Virginia, with the FBI. Morgan was you know, handling the day-to-day operations of the, the Detective Bureau. And then I really never saw this promotion coming to something. I was getting ready to retire, thinking of retiring in, in just a few weeks, actually. And then this was you know, brought to me a couple months ago and I really couldn't, couldn't pass it up. I mean, I love this department. I love this city. I love the people here. You know, I've been a pu- our public information officer for probably the last five years. So I've done all the media interviews, you know, all of our news releases, Facebook page, things like that. And I just really want to continue and hopefully keep our uh, department on a, you know, a positive note going forward. Nice. And congratulations again, for Thank sure. You. I mean, that's exciting news. And we were talking before we started recording about how many times in this business, somebody will set their sights on leaving and an opportunity will knock at the last minute and change your trajectory, which that's just one of the many things about this whole business and this career that just keeps you moving, keeps you moving. Uh, yesterday is the first time I've had a uniform on in, in many years. I think I haven't been assigned to uniform patrol for over 17 years. My children had never seen me. I have a, you know, three children. I've been married for 23 years. Have like you with Wendy, I've married way up. Yep. I've been, you know, my, my wife, Stephanie, uh, we have three children and 13, eight or 13, 10 and, and eight. And they never seen me in uniform. So, I mean, it's been a big change for everyone. I'll bet it has. I bet it has. Well, Morgan, I didn't realize until just now that you were the uh, deputy chief of investigations. Congratulations on that. I appreciate that. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your career path like Dave just did. Similar to Dave, I'm a, I'm a local resident of the area. I've been here my entire life. I spent a good deal of time preparing for law enforcement. Unlike Dave, that was something I always wanted to do. I, I, that was my, always my interest. It was not my parents' interest, and uh, they did not uh, really support that initially. They wanted me to go to college, and one of the things that they really pushed, they, they had a book publishing company. And one of the things, the subject matter that they covered was unsolved murder cases in the state of West Virginia. So I was kind of exposed to the law enforcement side, the investigative side from that. And that's what really piqued my interest. Kind of the deal that we made is go to college, get your bachelor's degree, and then we won't hold you back. If if that's still what you want to do, then they'll support me. And they've been extremely supportive ever since that time. I've been with the, the Beckley Police Department 14 years now. Three of those were on patrol. I did a period of time as a domestic violence officer in a combined role with the Detective Bureau. And the last several years, I've been the assistant chief of our bureau, where I handle kind of the day-to-day investigative side of things. Well, I'm going to start with you, and I'll pitch it back to Dave a little bit. Specifically with investigations, what do you think the things are that draw you to that, to spend that much time in that assignment? Well, I, there again, I would have to say probably my exposure through my parents, uh, having written these books on unsolved murders and cases. I was reviewing case files at 10 years old and looking at these homicide cases and so forth. There were times when we would get a phone call at our personal residence and it would be an inmate calling to speak to my dad from a a homicide case that he was looking at. Uh, So I think that kind of drove me to be interested in that subject matter. And and luckily here at Beckley, I've been able to kind of focus my effort in that direction. And I handle a lot of the the homicide cases. Dave, how about you? Well, you know, really... Initially, I had no intention of going to the detective bureau. I was thriving on patrol. You know, I was the top DUI officer in the state of West Virginia, the first drug recognition expert in the state of West Virginia. And really, I saw my goal was, uh, you know, highway safety, going to go work with NHTSA or somewhere once I retired. And then very early on, though, my chief had different plans. So nine months out of the academy, he assigns me to the detective bureau. At that point, you know, I really didn't feel like I was ready for it. And, and luckily, I had a good lieutenant on, on patrol that sent me down and said, you know, I think you really should consider this. You've only been here nine, year, nine months. You're doing a great job. But he said, I don't really think you're probably ready for investigations. And he'd been a, a prior chief of detectives. 
So I, you know, I took that advice. It was hard to turn down, but the chief was agreeable. So I continued to do the DUI thing and the aggressive traffic enforcement. And then a year later, you know, the chief really didn't give me a, chance, a choice at that point. He assigned me to the detective bureau. And instantly, once I got back there and, and got to working with some of the seasoned, experienced investigators, you know, I just you know, developed a passion for it and loved it. And, and I've actually been there ever since. You know, like I said, I spent 17 years there. I was a patrolman when I got put in the detective bureau, and I've got promoted through the, rank, the ranks the entire time without ever leaving. And I mean, just being able to, you see that, that you're able to make a difference. I mean, so much of law enforcement is reactive. But you really have an impact with the victims in these cases. You know, somebody's got to, to tell their story, especially on the homicides. And, I, you know, I really look at it. It's our, that's our job. And then we have a lot of complex traveling groups that pass through here with the interstates converging here in Beckley. So I really have focused a lot on those type of crimes as well with groups from Florida and, and Atlanta. And, and through that, you know, intelligence has been a big driving factor for me and information sharing and getting out and making you know, connections in the community connections to law enforcement throughout the country. That's what's made me, I, th- I feel, very successful. That's interesting stuff. I, I like, too, to point out, too, that you had somebody who was looking out for you in the beginning to kind of bridle you in until you had a little more experience. I, I uh, absolutely. That. I mean, at the time, I was on patrol, but I was working a lot of, we had a lot of extra duty for highway safety, and there wasn't a lot of people that was doing that. So I was making, actually, a lot of good money. So I was going to take a loss to go to the detective bureau. But, you know, this guy sent me down and, and really, I, I don't think I was ready. And, and I, I look at officers like Morgan when he got hired. We knew that he would be in the detective bureau at some point and we could have done it. I mean, you could probably hire him and put him in the detective bureau stri- straight. But I think you need that time on the road to develop what a good patrolman is, what a good investigation, you know, initial investigation is. And I, I feel very fortunate that I had Lieutenant Lemon at, at that point step down with me. and. And then I, I took a, a pause and then ultimately came back. I will say this, Morgan, when I got a chance to look at the case file, when we pulled the open records exemplary, and, and I'm, I'm telling you that just from my experience and everything, your articulation and organizational skills are amazing. And I think that that will come out here when we start talking about this case as people pick up on that. And that's super important in this business. A very well intended and sincere compliment. Well, Dave, before we move into the case, one more thing is tell us a little bit about Beckley, West Virginia and the Beckley PD. For example, how many people do you serve roughly in, in Beckley? Beckley is you know, very unique. We're the economic hub, hub of southern West Virginia. So Beckley is actually pretty small, 12 square miles. I think our population is 17,000. But during the day, that number swells. Uh, some estimates with the Chamber of Commerce is 150 to 200,000 because all the hospitals, the shopping centers, the hotels, the restaurants. Everyone comes here from surrounding counties to, to Beckley. So we see a lot of crime from that, you know, especially r- retail crime, you know, a lot of petty crime. But we also see a lot of violent crime that's associated with that, with the interstates converging here. You know, it's a very popular tourist des- destination with the New River Gorge close. We have ski resorts close by. So we serve way more of a population than just the 17,000 that live here, you know, you know, we have two colleges here in, in Beckley, three hospitals. So we're, we're pretty busy. Uh, the department, we have 58 sworn officers. Uh, we have a new police department as we're in here, just opened on 20, in 2019. Beckley is a, a great city. We, we have a lot of support from our elected officials, both at the regional, local, and state levels. So it's, it's a great place to work. And I, I feel that you know, we represent the city very well here at the Beckley Police Department. Well, it's a gorgeous town. I hadn't made it this far. I think I'd been to Charleston and those areas before on road trips, but it never made it over in this direction. So it's a gorgeous town. And the building we're in at the police department is amazing. Usually you don't see facilities like this if you don't have support from your local government and a good relationship. So hats off to you for that. That takes a lot of work for sure. Real quick, what would be a general thing about this murder? What sticks out with you all that makes this maybe unique? You know, I would have to say the the uncommon suspect in this case is what really stood out to us. I think when you hear the details of this case, you're going to form an opinion as to what you would expect to see as a suspect, and it's going to be completely off. And what we what we determined was uh, the suspect was really out of, out of character for this person, and it didn't fit the normal demographics of what we would expect to see somebody that would perpetuate this crime. Good. Looking forward to hearing those details, and I think the listeners will too, for sure. So 
Well, let's start. You know, like the basic stuff, when, where, and, and specifically how you got involved, how both of you got involved in this investigation. Well, back in 2015, it was February 7th. We received a call. It was about 5.30 p.m. Our detective bureau was called to the scene of a homicide. We responded to a, a residence on Odessa Avenue, uh, which is a very sparsely populated area. There's not a lot of residences there. It's uh, just two or three houses on the street. We responded there, and what we discovered is that a 69-year-old man had been bludgeoned to death. And we immediately secured that scene, began to walk, do a walk through the house, the residence, to see what we could determine. And we just discovered that one of the most gruesome scenes I certainly have I've ever experienced. Blood covered practically every surface in the home. Uh, there, there was clear evidence that the suspect had gone into the attic. There was blood in the attic, there was blood in the basement, blood in the sinks, blood in the bathrooms and in the showers, and it covered practically the entire residence. Now, when we were able to to locate the the victim in the the living room of the residence, uh, we determined that he had suffered some extraordinary trauma to his his head and face. And what it appeared is that there was a, a large amount of change in glass shards around him and it appeared that he had been bludgeoned with a jar of change, is, is what we were able to determine at that point. Do you recall what brought him and that home into the attention of the police department to locate him there? We did. The initial responding officers were, were dispatched by uh, our Raleigh County EOC. They had received a call from uh, Rexanne Browning. She stated that she had been in a, a, a family reunion earlier in the day, had responded back home, and discovered her husband in that state. And his name was? Uh, Ronald Browning. Ronald Browning. My recollection, you know, she had left that morning. She was the last, uh, his wife was the last one to see him. You know, she had left, I think, at 830 and went to a family reunion, returned home. You know, she had thought that it was odd throughout the day that she hadn't heard from him. Uh, but when she re- returns home and, and discovers this and, and they call, you know, I remember the call. The initial officer actually told me that he thought that it was a gunshot wound. There was no clear indication at that point to him, the initial officer, as to what had happened. And, you know, I'll never forget the time that uh, Morgan and I walked through that house. We've, you know, here in the Beckley, we've worked uh, primarily every major crime that's happened, especially every murder. And like he said, it was definitely the the worst scene I've ever seen, the the most amount of blood I've ever seen. And, you know, there was blood in in the refrigerator. There was blood. I mean, there was clothes in in the washing machine. There was so much about this scene that didn't make sense. You know, initially, when we get there, the front door is unlocked. I believe later we can get into interviews, but later the uh, wife told us that you know, when she returned home, the front door was open. And our initial walk through around the exterior of the house, there was a garage, kind of a garage door that led into the basement. That door was ajar, and there was blood on the, the lock of that. We could see blood outside of the house. So initially, I mean, it was a very chaotic scene. The way our department worked at that time, I was a sergeant in. We were the initial responding officers. He was assigned as the lead investigator. We had a couple other investigators with us, and traditionally we had handled our own crime scene processing. We didn't have a separate unit that, that did that. Normally we would take two detectives. They would be you know, stuck on the scene. Then the other two, uh, the assigned and, and co, we would then begin the investigation and the interviews. But we, we both got in this house, and we knew that it was way more than we would be able to handle with a limited staff of people, even with five detectives, seven detectives, it would have taken a, an enormous amount of time to process this scene. So at that point, we made the decision to call the Washington State Police Crime Scene Response Team to come out. And I think, Morgan, you, you contacted uh, Captain Mankins. That's point. correct, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was asking, Beckley, how you all handle crime scene processing, especially is involved in that is when you're talking, I'm thinking, boy, we're talking about stressed resources right off the bat. Do you have a, a typical arrangement with, with that organization? In my 20 years, we've used them twice. We used them in a murder in, in 2004, and then we used them in this case. And since then, you know, this case really changed the way we you know, go forward. Morgan leads our crime scene response team now. He's a, well, we've uh, cross-trained patrol officers and other personnel in the department, kind of like the FBI's evidence response team. You know, now when we have a crime scene, we have dedicated people that have additional training 
they respond out. They have no investigative uh, responsibility in that case other than the crime scene itself. And that frees up all the detectives to, to begin to process them and work the case. And they probably enjoy that, I bet. Oh, anytime you can give, get officers involved and then give them additional training. You know, we've sent them to various schools throughout the country of various disciplines. We allow them to specialize. And it's, it's all been under Morgan's direction. And, you know, he's led that. We conduct training with local colleges to do some mock scenes. And, and then he conducts you know, training with them on a monthly basis to, yeah. to, to keep up on it. You're training future detectives and giving them practical experience. That's actually excellent. Absolutely. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a good thing. Because I know from where I came from, we were specialized maybe to a fault like that. If you don't give people the opportunity to, to get their two cents in and get their hands dirty with it, no pun intended on this case, obviously, is if you don't give them a chance, it's hard for them to engage in the whole process. And back home, it was real common for a lot of people on patrol to really feel like that they didn't have a pivotal role in it. But in actuality, those first responding officers really carry the foundation of everything that starts from there. They certainly do. But that's, that's good. You're cultivating your new detective stock on a regular basis. That's pretty cool stuff. So you get to the scene, you, you call in and everything, and, and you get the assistance. And, and who was it again that assisted with the, the crime scene processing? It was the West Virginia State Police uh, crime response team gotcha. that responded to the scene. And then where do we go from there? You know, at that point, we wanted to speak to Ms. Browning, of course. She was still on scene. We asked that she come to our local office so that we could speak with her. One of the things that we noticed immediately is that there was an element of what we would consider to be overkill involved in this case. The injuries were so severe, the scene was so disheveled and, and, and ransacked and so forth that it seemed like someone had really gone out of their way, which is obviously, I'm sure you're aware, is more typical in interpersonal crimes, something where, where someone has a connection to this person and, and a reason for this kind of level of violence. I wouldn't want to say that she was necessarily a suspect, but she was a person of interest to us that we wanted to find out what she knew and if she could account for who may want to do this kind of violence to her 69-year-old husband. So we brought her in and, and we interviewed her. We were, we were able to clear her pretty quickly. You know, we, we spoke to her. I would ha say that she was in such a state of shock that her demeanor was uh, uncommon. It's not what we would typically expect. She was pretty uh, stoic, I would say. Uh, so, we, you know, that was a little off-putting, but uh, we certainly understood that with the traumatic scene that she had been through and, and, and had experienced. So based on her statement that she had been at this, we, we confirmed the details of her being at a reunion prior in the day. And like I said, we cleared her pretty quick. She provided limited information as to people who would want to do this. There was a contractor that had been involved in a kind of a dispute at the home. They, they weren't happy with the work and he wasn't happy with the pay and some sort of thing like that. Nothing that would arise to a level that would cause somebody to do this. Feel comfortable you cleared her quickly, right? It was pretty early on, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then there, uh, sorry, sorry, Dave. There were some things in the scene as well that really didn't make sense to us. And I think there's a couple questions that, or a couple answers she provided that gave some clarification. Like there was a near the victim's body was a, a gallon of milk, and the milk, you know, clearly had been drank, and there was blood on the milk. And she had told us she had actually purchased that the night prior. And that the victim doesn't drink milk at all. So, I mean, that was very unusual to us. And then the, the contractor dispute, that was something. And then she, she also mentioned some family issues with, you know, she'd only been married to him for a year and a half. And our victim has a very low risk level. He's a 70-year-old or 69-year-old man, a pastor of a church, no criminal history, no drug use, nothing that would indicate that he would succumb to a type of crime of this in his own home. So we did feel pretty quickly that she was not involved, but we also had some other family members that were brought to our attention. Actually, while we were on scene prior to, I think, interviewing, a granddaughter showed up and she was adamant that she wanted to get inside. She was concerned about getting money that you know, she thought would be hers. And I think Rexana also mentioned to us about possibly a suspect of the, the granddaughter or the, yeah, the granddaughter's uh, boyfriend. Hey, you know, there's more to the story. So go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims. So their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded and edited by David Lyons. 
The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform, as well as at MurderPolicePodcast.com, where you will find show notes, transcripts, information about the presenters, and much, much more. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, which is closed captioned for those that are hearing impaired. Just search for the Murder Police Podcast and you will find us. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us five stars and a written review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Make sure to subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.